good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, okay. Okay, let me just uh, I introduce myself. My name is Imran. I think most of you might know me. <laughs> yeah, so I'm from the Center for Interfaith Understanding. Uh, and this is just a small lunchtime gathering uh, because we have a uh, very famous uh, a distinguished uh, professor uh, from Yale University in the US. So when I heard that he's coming here, I was very excited because I've been reading all his books. You can see these are my personal collection. <laughs> so uh, I know him through his work, and I think uh, his kind of discourse is really very useful, especially for many of us here who are working in the interfaith scene. Uh, and some of us here are also theologians. Uh, I'm not a theologian, uh, but I know there are many theologians here, uh, both Muslim and Christian. So the audience is pretty mixed. Uh, so I hope we can have a good discussion. Uh, before I start, maybe I just set a bit of context. Uh, but firstly, I just want to thank, before I forget here, yeah, to thank uh, uh, Dan. Dan, come see if I decide from. No, 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 all right, uh, so Dan is from Veritas Forum, and Veritas is a Christian uh, organization that has been going around campus in U.S. Campuses in U.S. Uh, engaging uh, on uh, public discourse uh, with the Christian community and also with the interreligious community in the U.S. So thank you for bringing uh, Professor Miroslav both here. Uh, and also thank you to this month uh, for connecting again. Uh, and this uh, session today is co-organized with Fellowship of Evangelical Students, which this month is dating. And I've spoken at FES forum in the past, so that's how I got to know them. They are doing very good work uh, in terms of trying to bring uh, critical discourses and interreligious uh, ideas within the Christian community. Uh, also, thank you to the sponsorship of this place by the Graduates Christian Fellowship. Uh, I'm not sure who to thank. Uh, Marcus uh, and Ellen. Thank you very much. Uh, so I know Marcus and Ellen very well because uh, we've been doing Christian-Muslim dialogues for the last, how many years? Yeah. <laughs> four years, four years. So every year we have about three sessions uh, discussing various uh, topics that are critical in uh, Christian-Muslim the theology. Right? Uh, so thank you, GCR, again for the partnership. Um, I think in Singapore, and Prof just learning about the context and the landscape here. He had a very good uh, forum yesterday uh, together with Professor Kevin Tan uh, from uh, the famous constitutional law expert in Singapore. <coughs> uh, it was moderated by uh, Eugene Tan, Professor Eugene Tan also. So it was a very good forum. Uh, and I think that is the crux of the matter is Singapore is also shifting as a society. Uh, in the past, of course, we had to grapple with the rise of religious resurgence or religious revivalism, as some would call it, uh, where, you know, the defeat of the secularization thesis, in the sense that, you know, the idea that is sec secularism marches on, religion be relegated to the private sphere, has very little function or even relevance to public life. Uh, so that is the secularization thesis, and somehow in the 60s, 70s, uh, that idea has been thoroughly defeated, in the sense, particularly, since the 1970s when we see the growth uh, and the emergence of religious communities that are asserting themselves within the public space and wanting to have a voice in, in, in public discourses. Uh, and that is a global change, uh, but also Singapore also was experiencing that across all faith communities. So it's not just the Christians who are having a revival, Muslims also, and Buddhist revivalism is also, was also taking place. So. The tensions that emerged in the 1980s was quite critical in terms of us thinking through where we are today. Uh, two things that were highlighted in the 1987 publication by the MCD, Ministry of Community Development at that time. Today it's, and they changed to MCDS and then today at CCY, which uh, uh, Provia Cope was formerly also the minister with that portfolio of Minister of Culture, Community and Youth. Uh, that report in 1987 that was commissioned to a group of academics in and U.S. at the time, highlighted uh, some issues with religious revivalism. So two of it is actually, one is aggressive proselytization that has somehow created a lot of tensions interreligiously, not just within or not just across 
faith communities, but also within faith communities. Uh, that was one. Uh, but at the same time, of course, Article 15 of the Singapore Constitution also granted religious freedom and the freedom to propagate your beliefs. So the freedom to propagate your beliefs has to be there has to also take into consideration how aggressive proselytization also may generate uh, some conflicts. Yeah. So that was one issue that uh, was highlighted in that paper. Secondly, was uh, the incursion of lobbying groups uh, that led to a kind of politicization of religion that led to uh, also the mixing of religion and politics. So all that actually sets the context to a unique legislation that Singapore has, the Maintenance of Religious Act in 1990. Uh, so that somehow sets the tone when issues of religion have become dicey and therefore within the public discourse that has to be calibrated well in the sense that religious communities need to just kind of put it in a plant and mind your own business. <laughs> uh, but when you enter into the public space, that public space has to be the common space that needs to be expanded with commonalities, with civic discourse, with ideas of if you religion wants to do good, then it has to contribute to the social well-being of the nation as a whole, which is the idea of common good, or maybe probably use the term of the flourishing of human society. Um, but at the same time also, it also means that certain stereotypical views of each community persist. Now, September 11 was another turning point, I think, in Singapore's history, where we find that the rise of extremism and violent extremism actually threatens again to split this fabric of society, which is multi-religious, multicultural, multi-ethnicity that we have here in Singapore. Uh, and terrorism becomes a main focus also, and that also puts another pressure in terms of how do we engage with this whole issue of religion in the public space. Of course, uh, Singapore society was, is also changing. About 18.5% of the population now profess not to belong to any faith tradition. Uh, we had just a chat outside just now. This could be atheists, agnostics, uh, spiritual but not religious, uh, free thinkers, you know, whatever labels or terms you use. Uh, but some of them now have been uh, congregating under a legitimate society called Humanist Society that was approved in 2010. Uh, so Singapore's uh, demography was also changing and therefore the non-religious voices also do have things to say about religion in the public space. So it's no more about keeping religion out of the public discourse, but it has shifted into how do we discuss productively about religion in the public space, while bearing in mind that there is always the potential of conflict that can emerge if this is not handled well, right? But it's no longer about a need uh, distinction, no discussion on religion. Public space, you can't do that. More than 80% 80, 80 of Singapore's population profess to have a religion, therefore religion is a very important element in Singapore's landscape. We can't run away from it, but how then do we calibrate and manage this well? So that is a, is a very primary concern right now. Now, secondly also, uh, no, sorry, I'm not giving you a lecture today. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I can go on and on. Uh, I'll just uh, finish with uh, two other points. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> secondly, also, uh, we can't run away from the idea of politics. Yeah? So, yes, we understand the, the importance of not politizing, politicizing religion because that will really create a lot of problems and we've seen the impact of it in many other societies. But politics is part of everyday lives. Many of the issues that are emerging today, that we are discussing, that we are thinking about, that we are finding answers to, has a political dimension. Right? It might be couched in uh, ethical, moral issues, or even in everyday kind of cultural practices, but there are also political imports to it. And religion and politics has never been separated throughout human history. But the type of engagement between religion and politics is where we need to understand carefully. How, do, how can religion engage productively in the political discourse without it being used as a vehicle to further political agendas and then split society and give rise to a lot of conflicts as well we observe in many other parts of the world. So that is the dicey part. Now the third element is also as religion become more and more visible in the public space, in the public discourse, 
we are also open to the issue of religious offense. Now that was the question I asked Prof yesterday, uh, and Prof Kevin and yourself uh, gave some tips on, on that, but it would be useful also to share with the audience here. How do we deal with the idea of religious offense? Now we can go with the common lowest common denominator, there will always be someone somewhere out there who will be offended by anything and everything, right? But then, if we just curtail any form of discussion because we have to accede to the lowest common denominator, we will not make progress in terms of really having a robust, pluralistic, democratic public space for discourse on religion. And that is essentially what uh, Prof. Wall's focus and attention is in his scholarship. Uh, I find this book here, uh, A Public Faith, How Followers of Christ Should Serve the Common Good, uh, as a useful starting point in thinking through these issues. Of course, as a Christian theologian, he quotes a lot from the Christian tradition, but that doesn't mean that those who are non-Christians cannot learn from it. Uh, another important book uh, that you must read, uh, it's all out there, yeah, isn't it? There is. <laughs> uh, but you can go to the Biblical Graduate School of Theology, they have a very nice bookshop there. I hope I uh, still have copies of it, but I know you have uh, Prof's uh, books there. It's called Flourishing Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World. So it's how religion can contribute to the flourishing of, uh, of humanity instead of the current focus of how religion becomes a source of conflict and violence. Uh, of course, yes, interestingly written, and this is very relevant to those who are thinking through what is going on in Malaysia, especially with the Allah issue, right? That Christians cannot use the term Allah, and yes, address that, uh, not in the Malaysian context, but within the wider history of Christian-Muslim relations. Uh, that's there. But many of us are also uh, familiar with the common word document uh, that was issued by uh, 100 over Muslim theologians and scholars. Uh, uh, and then that document was also signed by many Christian theologians. And it has evolved into a common word. Uh, in fact, uh, Prince Ghazi was the one that mooted the idea of having uh, World Interfaith Harmony Week uh, in February. Uh, and that has become a movement. And, Professor at the forefront of it also. Uh, but of course, he was initially known for this book, Exclusion and Embrace, uh, which I hope he will also discuss some of the key ideas in this book. So, Professor Miroslav Wolf is uh, currently the Henry B. Wright uh, Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale Divinity School. Uh, and Singapore is very fortunate, you know. Just two weeks ago, we had another big scholar from the US, Professor Francis Clooney, uh, who was here to give a public lecture and was moderated also by Prof. Yaakov Ibrahim. Uh, and today we have you, so one from Harvard, one from Yale. I'm not sure who we can have this one, but we are just fortunate that uh, we have a lot of these scholars coming through. And for many of us who are working in the interfaith scene, uh, we really need to be engaged in the discourse beyond just uh, eating together and taking photos together. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to develop capabilities for interfaith leadership to bring the discourse forward and I'm thankful also uh, Mr. Alami, Ambassador Alami Musa is here who's heading the studies in interreligious relations in plural societies program uh, and that also has been at the forefront uh, of pushing for a greater interfaith discourse in Singapore and they, under RSIS have been had, uh, previously organized uh, just in June the International Conference on Cohesive Society it was opened by our Madam President, Adam uh, And I must also acknowledge Mr. Amir Ali, who is the Justice of Peace. So if you have any conflicts, come to him, he will mediate for you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone uh, for coming. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Professor Miroslav Wolf is also the Director of the uh, Center for sorry, uh, Faith, and Faith and Culture at Yale University. Uh, we have a Yale NUS college here. Uh, and uh, we are also engaging with them because there is a Yakim Hao Chair in Comparative uh, Religion there. Uh, and the late uh, Reverend Yakim Hao has been at the forefront of promoting interfaith work also in Singapore. Uh, uh, and uh, many of us here who are in the interfaith seat uh, have benefited a lot also from his advice and guidance on interfaith matters uh, here in Singapore. So I just want to acknowledge that because he has a chair in the US and he passed away three years ago. Yeah, so without further ado, let's give a round of applause to the Professor. So the title that I was assigned to speak on uh, comes from uh, uh, the title of my book, uh, Exclusion and Embrace. Uh, and the book was uh, written some <clears throat> 
20, almost 25 years ago. Um, and I, I want to pick up on some of the major themes of uh, this, this book and bring them to today's uh, kind of setting to open up uh, the discussion. Obviously, I cannot speak about the situation in Singapore. You know that much better than I do. I'm here to learn about that, but I can tell you something about my own uh, experience. Um, and my own experience in particular with the question of uh, identity, religious, uh, but ethnic, and other forms of identities that often overlap. That was the theme of the book, Exclusion and Embrace, um, Identity and Otherness in the Context of Conflict. Uh, identity and otherness and the possibilities of reconciliation. And uh, maybe a two years ago or so, a year and a half ago, a friend of mine from UK wrote me a letter and he said, email, and he said, you know, your book is more relevant today than it was when you originally wrote it uh, <laughs> 25 uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, that's, that's, that's good, uh, and that's bad. <laughs> it's bad for the world. <laughs> it, it's good for, uh, for, for me as, a, 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 as an author. So I prepared then a second edition, revised edition of the book, and it's just about to, to come out. And as I was reflecting about this comment of my, uh, my um, acquaintance and friend, I thought that's really in many ways true. So I wrote the book in the 90s and when I wrote uh, the book, uh, the world was uh, kind of engaged in the robust processes of globalization. The world was united. You could have seen it very easily in Europe, the wall, Berlin Wall had fallen down, all, all the European countries were consolidating uh, other joint members for joining, and uh, so the, there was a kind of unity uh, in the area of Europe and the world uh, as a whole. And um, of course, at the same time, many conflicts in the world were happening around the issue of identity, focused on the question of identity, not maybe based on identity, but focused on it, because uh, conflicts often have multiple sources uh, and identities end up being the focal point of those conflicts. But many conflicts were going on, some if I recall correctly, some 50 conflicts worldwide were going on. But in some ways you could see those conflicts uh, as uh, being on the margins. I remember uh, very well uh, today my own country, Croatia, was establishing itself as an independent uh, nation and there was always a complaint. Why are Croatians, why are Serbians fighting when everybody else is uniting? How come you guys are barbarians down in the south of Europe and you can't get on with the program? Uh, and uh, French, famous French intellectual um, uh, Alain Finkelkraut uh, wrote a book, How Can One Be a Croatian? in order to justify the struggles for a particular form of uh, identity. So th this was the environment then. Um, uh, if you look at the environment uh, today, uh, today we have what used to be rip currents in the tide of globalization have now become a major tide themselves. Nationalisms and identity-based politics is dominating the whole world. It's dominating, uh, for instance, in the United States and elsewhere in Europe campuses. It's dominating smaller communities. It's dominating electoral politics within uh, nations. It's dominating also global uh, affairs. Um, you have a uh, rise of uh, or election of Donald Trump can be symbolic uh, of that, but obviously before Trump there was a Putin, before Putin, uh, and along with Putin there were other uh, great uh, leaders who see themselves as embodying somehow a sense of a nation that stands in contrast with other nations. We be there great nations like China, India, uh, Russia, or the United States, so we there smaller. Uh, nations like many uh, in the world, you have this uh, kind of sense of 
identity has become, again, one of the major focal points of politics at various uh, levels. And you can see that recently two books have been published on the question of identity, many others as well. But one was, uh, one was published by Francis Fukuyama. By Francis Fukuyama on identity and basically says this is the um, dominant metaphor which helps us explain uh, conflicts uh, in the world today. Similarly, um, 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 Apia has written a book on identity and he's known for his work on cosmopolitanism, but again, he thinks the title of the book is The Lies That Bind. <laughs> right? so, so the idea is of it, these identities are imagined, and in some ways they are not the truth about the realities, but they are imaginaries and how we imagine ourselves. And uh, so uh, they bind us together, but bind us not as truth about ourselves, but in some ways also as lies um, that tell a certain kind of story that we see and want to, uh, want to hear. Um, so the, with the emergence of the question of, of identity, um, you can also see how the identities themselves have become um, very much hardened. Boundaries between groups uh, have become conflictual in that sense, that's in a sense the reason for the assertion of identities, which is to say then that there are strong tensions along uh, the lines of almost impermeable uh, boundaries. And so what used to be the feature of fundamentalism, that uh, the boundary was impermeable for, for the others, the other could not imagine themselves, one cannot imagine themselves in the shoes of the other, has become now a feature just about of most of the movements that we are experiencing, high level of conflict. And I think that poses a, a particular kind of uh, challenge. And it poses a particular kind of challenge when Kind of identity politics more generally is associated with the religious belonging. Then what occurs often is a certain kind of sacralization of identity and that sacralization of identity heightens the stakes uh, of, uh, of the conflict. Uh, again, we can see that in many uh, settings where religious forms of uh, identity exacerbate the conflicts that are being carried on uh, on other, uh, other grounds. So for me, um, as I was writing the book, uh, Exclusion and Grace, uh, the central issue was the character of identity. How do I construe identity in a kind of salutary way? So now, I come, it's easy to say, well, identities don't matter, but I come from a small country, uh, Croatia, right? And if we don't worry about our identity, we're going to disappear because there are these big players who exert influence left and right uh, on us. So the question of identity for us is an existential question. I think that's also true at a very much personal level in the smaller community levels unless we have identities, we aren't, we don't exist. So to have existence in the world, you need to have either personal identity, you need to have boundaries. And within those boundaries, you can exist as a particular somebody. And so identities are, in many ways, um, formative, creative of our very character as individual human beings, as well as communities. And so it's important to attend to identities, but the question becomes, how does one attend well to identities? In the question and answer uh, part of, uh, of uh, the presentation yesterday, uh, I have mentioned what I consider to be a really important issue of how we negotiate identities. Namely, I make the distinction between uh, identities that are established through drawing, uh, by emphasizing the boundaries, and identities that are established by e emphasizing the center of identity. Uh, the differentiation comes from a 
very small five page long article by a Christian missiologist. Uh, and he differentiates uh, in mathematical terms, I don't know much about math, but he uses that analogy between centered sets and bounded sets. And the distinction between the, these two sets is that one is organized around the center and the other one is organized around monitoring the boundaries and in that way ensuring the identities. And you can predict that if you manage identity by simply concentrating on boundaries, then the essential thing would be for you to be different than somebody else. Uh, as soon as you come to somehow resemble the other, you're, uh, you're encountering the problem. Then you will encounter what Freud has called the curse of small differences. Then you have to reassert your difference just because the other has become too similar uh, to you. But if you think of identity that is formed by the center, central convictions, then it can very easily be that you can uh, you don't you have to attend to boundaries, but you don't have to take the, the boundaries so, so seriously. Boundaries can become porous so that traffic can come in uh, and traffic can come out uh, as well. And um, I advocate in this book uh, the idea of these uh, identities defined by the center and consequently identities and boundary maintenance um, being such that traffic happens on the, uh, along the boundaries. Um, so, uh, if, so I often um, give an image of my, of my home. Imagine if you have boundaries in home and it had no openings. <laughs> it becomes a grave, right? We have, when we have home, we have doors so we can go in and out. Uh, we engage with the other world, we return back to our space that is uh, properly ours, that we have arranged the way we want it arranged. We have windows to open to see what the neighbors are doing, to make sure that everything's going, going, going okay. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have both closure and we have also uh, boundaries. And I th uh, we, we have uh, kind of clear lines of uh, information. And I think, in, especially in the world, in the pluralistic world, it is essential to maintain just such porous boundaries. And so you can say without boundary maintenance, there wouldn't be any identities. But if you have a impermeable boundaries, you have internally graves, so to speak. You have a frozen identities that cannot march in time. And central here is that we live in time. And living in time, we develop our identities, uh, develop, and we live with others, and therefore exchange between the two becomes and uh, is, uh, is fundamental. Now, sometimes that's difficult for religious folks to manage, right? Because what we, what we seek to manage in terms of boundaries is the boundaries of what is really profoundly important to us, what matters more than anything else, what is sacred, various ways in which we can express that idea. And so I think one of the central challenges for us as religious people becomes how do we properly man maintain boundaries so that the boundaries do not become simply adversarial. And uh, I take it that each of the religious traditions will have their own ways of approaching that, that question as uh, I think about it, I wrote it from the Christian standpoint. And from the Christian standpoint, I always thought that the central aspect of this boundary maintenance was uh, the command to love one's neighbor. Uh, the command of love, and indeed in the Christian tradition, it's a command to love one's enemy. We can obviously discuss what love there means exactly. But nonetheless, um, it is a command to love one's enemy. And so for me, that became a, a central question. So when you formally think of identities as having these porous boundaries, maintenance of those boundaries entails commitment to the good of the other who is your neighbor, attending to them and seeking reconciliation with that person, seeking conviviality, which is uh, kind of fundamental to who we 
uh, who I think Christian, what I think Christian identity ought, uh, ought to be. Now, obviously, there are many issues that immediately uh, emerge, and particularly the three issues that emerge is question of truth, <laughs> uh, question of justice, and question of uh, use of power or violence. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time on, on these, but let me end with uh, what I have described in this book, a phenomenology of embrace. Now, for this idea of porous boundaries that is, welcomes the other person and yet maintains itself, wants to be itself, uh, I have uh, used the idea of the image of embrace. And I remember I was once speaking in Sri Lanka when I was developing this, this idea. And uh, there, there was an African bishop and there was a German professor in my audience. Uh, and I brought up this idea of embrace. And the German professor immediately said to me, no, no, that's too intimate. <laughs> <laughs> He's OK, but embrace it. No, no, no. And then an African bishop said, no, no, we need proper embrace. <laughs> You can't just have a handshake. I, at that time, I didn't have a presence of mind to say, but handshake is also an embrace. Yes. Yeah? Pinky, called it pinky, is also <laughs> an embrace. A little one, but nonetheless uh, embrace. And it has what I would describe a singular phenomenology. So what does it take to embrace? First, arms go open, right? Arms go open is a sign of invitation. It's a sign uh, I am not sufficient to myself, right? I need, I want, I desire for you to be part of who I am, of my own identity, of my own life. But before the word, before the, the arms can close, which is also a step, there is another element, very important element, and that's an element of waiting. But if I open my arms, but I don't wait, then I won't have embraced, I'm going to be grabbing somebody, right? <laughs> this is going to be an aggressive act rather than embrace. Embrace presumes that the other person wants to make a movement toward me. And so the waiting honors and respects what the other person needs and wants. So arms open is an invitation, and then comes the waiting. And waiting is a structurally central element in the act of, of embrace. And then comes the embrace, mutual embrace, right? which is to say we each signal to one another that we belong to each other, that we are not, though each having our own identity, we are not self-sufficient and therefore engage the other and somehow let the other shape in part our own identity. But then the final step is absolutely crucial. Arms have to open again. <laughs> because if arms just stay closed, then again, you don't have an embrace. You have a capture of somebody, right? <laughs> uh, and holding of somebody which is not an embrace. Now, opening of arms means uh, I am myself, right? You've been part of me. But I still have my own identity, which needs to be preserved. You are yourself, and you cannot be simply integrated, assimilated into me, neither I into you. We are discrete and independent, though we profoundly related uh, entities. Now, I think that applies for siblings' relationships, it applies for spousal relationships, for family relationships, it applies also for relationship between ethnic groups, I think it applies also for relationship between religious traditions. Uh, a kind of learning that happens when I'm open to another person, kind of waiting for the other person to come in the respect uh, for them, a uh, kind of conjoining of two in the moment of interchange, and then opening up the space so that the other person can process, be themselves, and see how the encounter can be incorporated, integrated into the very identity of the person with, with, with whom we have been engaged. Now, to me, that is a, a very simple, in a sense, way of describing what happens in many of the interhuman exchanges, 
but also what happens in ecumenical exchanges when they are done well. And in order to negotiate boundaries, in order to um, not to have clashing identities, we need these kinds of encounters. They're mutually enriching and leave each one of us to be freely who we actually are while being enriched by one another. I think I will end here. This is about 20 minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> And okay. right, so um, we we'll change the program a bit. So we'll have discussion now. So if you have anything to, to bring to attention of Prof and questions, and then after that, then we'll just break for uh, lunch. So we have about maybe 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Lee. Um, welcome to Singapore. Thank you. Um, so I, um, I'm a secretary. Um, I have a question on. Um, basically, vocabulary um, and challenges of vocabulary that we all hear in church. So, uh, one of the things I do uh, most of the time during the day is I dream up projects uh, related to photography and only on Singapore and on Singapore issues. That's so a cool one, thing to do. <laughs> so, the, so, the one that I'm trying to do now is uh, called Fence. Mm. Uh, what, what does getting pissed off in Singapore look like? <laughs> and, and how, how, how should we talk about it? So, so my question is, since you're coming from, from a, a school that's teaching and preparing new students or people in the community, um, so I've been to church all my life, and I think part of the issue with uh, being Christian and, and, and also followers of of, of Jesus and, and the idea of heaven and God and all that is that there's a this we, we, we took difference the word difference to a very high level we are chosen we are uh, set apart we are different and so uh, and so and, and we're safe and so we're better than the rest so this whole thing about boundaries is actually made worse by a lot of this kind of rhetoric, mm. to the point that it's sprouted of things like things that we can offer like colonialism, power, and all that. And we're living with all of that today. So, in, in your comments, to make this thing porous, and you, know, you talk about the word embrace, right? Even that word just, just gets everybody all you know, talking about what it really means. That's the point so, of it. Uh, <laughs> That's the point and, of it to get yes, people talking. And, and, and so, um, in, in, your, in your mind, this vocabulary from a Christian point of view doesn't need to change. We need to be more mindful of what we say when we are chosen, we are given, we are saved. We are, should we have new vocabulary so that we don't create more of this? difference and then get everybody all this off, you know? Yeah, I, th I think one important element <laughs> is to watch the vocabulary, right? To attend to uh, implications that it has, implications for us, what it does to us, shaping who we are, but how it's also heard by others. Right? And there's two sides to the, to the vocabulary. But... Uh, and I, in many areas, vocabulary is very important. Um, you know, re relationship between uh, men and women, vocabulary is really important uh, because it, it kind of names certain kind of uh, hierarchical relationships and so forth. But on the other hand, so, so all of this I, I think is very important. But at the same time, I think that vocab change in vocabulary is overrated. We think that we are achieving something, but in fact, unless we change the patterns of behavior, uh, the new words get infused by the same kind of meaning on account of the patterns of behaviors because uh, language doesn't float freely in the air. Language is tied, is a form of practice and is tied to ordinary practices in life. And so my sense would be we've got to attend both to the language uh, and also, and above all, to kind of practices of uh, interchange with one another. Obviously, we have interchanges through language, 
but we have also interchanges that are quite apart from uh, from language, and I think we need both the uh, inner transformation, structural transformation, as well as attention to to the language. And of course, uh, you know, one set of uh, set of uh, terms and vocabularies work well in one setting, translate into into a different setting, and it suddenly doesn't quite quite work. So we have to think about rhetorical situations. Uh, as well in experiences with other uh, people. You know, part of the reason why I use the vocabulary of embrace, obviously it has its own, uh, it, it can have prob- be problematic in some, uh, some ways, but, but it's also a way to uh, think of reconciliation, forgiveness, uh, shifts in identity in a ways that is a little bit uh, surprising, novel, that let us see things slightly from a different angle just in order to ask the question, well, what what does it mean for the the fine structure of our relationship to um, be in relationship with someone? Um, Can you hear Methodist Christian Church? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I was fascinated that you used Paul Hewitt's all the senses, I'm just not familiar with that. Um, You've been talking a lot about the boundaries. I'd like to ask a question about the center. Yeah. Because Hebert, um, you know, used would use Christ, God yeah. as a center. So, in a multicultural setting, what could be cent- what could be the center? Or are we talking about multiple centers? Yeah, that, that, that's where I would go with it, right? So, so if you if you if you had a single center, uh, suddenly identities would would uh, be fluid. Uh, a lot would be lost. Uh, maybe something will be gained, but a lot would be lost. I, I think, in, at least in religious religious context, um, uh, I think we ought to operate with kind of multiple centers. I don't think that the center of a Buddhist for a Buddhist uh, is, would be the same as the center for for a Christian. And I want to encounter Buddhist with his or her center, uh, just like I think I want to encounter them as myself with having my entire life orientation being around Jesus Christ. Uh, I think I would deny my own identity, I'm speaking just personally for myself, if that's not what I did. Um, so it's multi-centered, and if I'm right, this would allow that if we didn't define ourselves primarily through boundaries, but through centers, it would allow us to be more fluid on the boundaries. And this was partly Paul Hebert's uh, kind of intention with it. Um, obviously, then the immediate question, well, how do you define Christ? <laughs> Is Christ too stable, right? So, so we, we, we'd have to think about what do doctrinal positions then mean? How does one infuse religious language with a kind of apophaticism, with humility, with not quite fully knowing and being able to express that which organizes our our lives. Um, yeah. Can I just one follow sure. up? But do we, so in this room with Christian sentences, must we have one center amongst us, or, or should we have several centers? So, so I, 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 I would want to plead for, for multi, multiple centers not having necessarily one center, and letting what is then bind us emerge in, in the encounter itself. Um, now that's a, that's a wager, wager, that something actually would emerge. Uh, but it's not an unfounded completely wager. We've had situations where we have discovered, looked at each other in the eyes, being honest with one another, and, and we, we realized, wow, there's something really profoundly important that binds us. And if we don't then insist on uh, defining ourselves to our difference primarily, and therefore being scared of the discovery of commonality, we can make a journey into exploration of what binds and how that which binds us also makes us different from one another. So I think that will be a... Uh, just one small uh, addition. I think that's also a genius of the so-called scriptural reasoning uh, approach, because it, it kind of it, it, it pulls you out of the 
and pulls the strict doctrine out of identity question and lets the other person read your sacred book and you find yourself in it. Multiple centers, two sets of scriptures, but nonetheless very important commonalities. But multiple centers means well, the ancient, ancient. Um, why can't it be that over time as you evolve and you develop uh, that centers forest and then kind of some commonalities and you can see it kind of come together uh, and what we should endeavor to achieve is a kind of common center shared by different uh, individuals. She, uh, I, possible. Uh, but I, 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 what, what I don't want to do is in advance determine what the result is going to be. Because then uh, I've, uh, th then, then I already know what the center is, <laughs> that is to say, right? That I already know that there must be a center and that we can, a common center, and that we can relate positively to one another only if we agree at the core, right? Um, I'm not sure that that's true, that that's the only situation in which common life is possible. Now, if one thinks of, of those multiple centers as profoundly different, then maybe that's, that's true. But I think what we are discovering also, that nonetheless, say, say I think of uh, Jesus Christ is, is divine and human. And for me, that may be non-negotiable, which it is for me. But it doesn't mean that a Muslim cannot discover within that center that, as I have understood it, something which resonates with the center that has been differently defined from the Muslim standpoint. And so kind of discoveries where our centers overlap, though not being identical, so that when we embrace one another, ah, the centers go and overlap, when we let each other go, the centers remain, but they are slightly maybe enriched by the encounter because I've seen myself from the perspective of another. Something like that is what I imagine. I think that I can intervene at this stage. It's, yeah, I mean, there's an elephant in the room. What's the elephant? The elephant in the room. Where? Is the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's easy to say we can have multiple centers here on Earth because we can always find something common to focus on beyond our own exclusive uh, ideas on the divine and all that. question will be, and is there an elephant in the room? Will there be multiple centers in the hereafter? <laughs> or, <laughs> if theologically we believe in the idea of heaven and hell, yeah, yeah. what would that mean when we say that there are multiple centers and all this is one center? Because that is really at the heart of the existential matter that many people are grappling with. Fine, we can say on earth, we can live together, we can eat together, we can focus on things that matter for human flourishing. But at the end of the day, if I think that there's no salvation outside Christ, for example. Yeah. Or all non-Muslims will go to hell. Yeah. How do I reconcile that idea uh, and, and be at ease with the here and now? Sorry, can I just add to that? So, relating to that, it's really about while we are trying to make the boundary permeable. It's about whether opening up that course makes me, I wouldn't say for lack of a better, I mean fidel to that very boundary that I was asked to be in. So I have to take a stand, either way, I'm in or out somewhere by opening up the doors. So it's like when I try to find that area you're trying to discover, but that very one or two things which can't be negotiated, it's really the reason why the boundaries are born, you see. So how then do, let's say, an individual like me, for example, I'm trying to sort of come across it as a basis while also trying to stick with not just a single identity, but with a community identity, yeah, yeah. how do we... Because yeah. um, the identities have different layers as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you're 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 bringing up the question of of communities and a relationship between personal identity as a member of or, or as a as a um, religious person of a certain certain kind and a communal identity. Because 
obviously these have to be negotiated. They're always negotiated, right? Never individual fits fully into the community, but once you add the interfaith dimension to it, the strain can become such that one might be closer to one's interfaith interlocutor in certain regards than one is to the faith community to which one belongs. So one has to do interpretative work, uh, one has to uh, try to bring along the community uh, on that same uh, kind of a journey. Um, I, I think that's how I would think of it, and obviously that just uh, underscores that within each of the religious traditions there are a wide variety of perspectives and people construe centers differently, and these are the, the debates uh, rage within communities that are sometimes very, very strenuous and very divisive, as we, as we know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've experienced that myself uh, in my own interfaith, uh, inter-Christian dialogues, as well as interfaith dialogues, I've experienced the uh, kind of tensions that, that occur in this in, in this um, On the question of uh, whether there are multiple centers, um, uh, eschatologically, <laughs> uh, I don't know what the furniture of heaven is. <laughs> so, so this is this is all to say, not to be funny, but this is all to say that there's a certain kind of um, apophathicism, certain kind of unknowing, not knowing, is appropriate uh, for that. Uh, I think, in some ways, I want to think of the world to come as as almost. Um, I don't want to be misunderstood, but almost like a utopian space that shapes the longings for truth together with another person. Right? So I imagine heaven as being the world of love where all people are gathered together around the single source of holiness. Right? Um, and that to me is a motivating factor to search for truth for myself as well as for truth in community, uh, community with others. But I hope you're going to become a Christian now. <laughs> Actually, the, 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 just, to, just to comment on this, it's very interesting that in Christian imagination, if you look at the, uh, look, look at the book of Revelation, very end, uh, it doesn't have a temple. It doesn't have religion. It's not because we won't be worshiping God. It's not because we won't be uh, walking in the path of God. To the contrary, it's going to be so much part of our very being that we wouldn't need religious forms, therefore differentiated religious forms, in order to express our fundamental belonging to God and God's belonging to us. That's, that's a kind of Christian, it's a kind of end of religion. Uh, that Christians imagine that. This is heretical, maybe, for, for some. <laughs> but it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely true. <laughs> I, mean, I guess the problem is because religion, as understood today, is supposed to bring certainty. And then what you are describing has a lot of uh, ambiguity and uncertainty, which many may not be attracted to. You know? that, 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 may, that, may be, that may be true. Um, I would want to invite them to observe themselves, uh, to experience themselves, and then uh, I, I, they'll notice the doubt that accompanies faith, uh, uncertainty within certainty. We we want we want a mathematical kind of uh, certainty, and existentially we can't have it. I think faith is by very nature a risk. There was a question. Okay, oh, wait, yeah. hang on. Uh, how many wants to ask a question? Okay. Uh, Anyone else? So we'll take this final round of questions. You can continue to engage over lunch later. Anyone else? So we'll just end with this too. Father Bruno, and then after the prof. In a way, to continue on this topic, and maybe one way of answering this question, uh, because this topic was thinking about in one particular theology in Christianity that you know, we are chosen, we are saved, we are forgiven. <laughs> I think in every religion there will be different theology. Oh, sorry, I didn't say I'm a Catholic priest. 
So in every religion, there will be different theologies. And I think one possible theology in Christianity is to say, we are all saved, we are all forgiven, we are all chosen, whatever our religion. And we don't need to change our religion to be chosen, saved, uh, forgiven, etc. Then, in a way, it solves the... Until here, hereafter, we are all already saved and forgiven and welcomed and accepted. And, and in a way, we are all really one community. Is that very simple? You can read the life of Jesus in this way. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm hearing all this for the first time, so forgive me my question. <laughs> I thought the concept of the boundary and center is an interesting concept. But very often you find groups who want to preserve both the center and the boundary. Because for them, the boundary will be in the center. Sure. If you don't keep the boundary, the center might fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're facing a lot of problems. So, how do you convince people that that's not the way to go? Because at the end of the day, that philosophy that you mentioned then threatens their very identity. Sure, sure. No, no, I understand. But I think that would be the feature of fundamentalism and extreme forms of uh, religiosity. Uh, and precisely because the boundaries are so unporous, they're also. Um, unresponsive to arguments about those boundaries, right? So kind of there's a reinforcing uh, stabilization of, of boundaries. So anytime you want to crack the thing open, you become uh, uh, the enemy, uh, destabilize identity. Um, it, it, it's not clear, uh, at least my experience was such that, it, that, that, that it, that's the most difficult case. Um, where uh, uh, I think life maybe is the way to open and make sensitive boundary, uh, not an argument. But if I can, because I think at the moment there are a lot of boundary issues facing. Give my own simple example. So recently we just celebrated the sacrifice in other arts. Yeah. But there's a growing tendency among young Muslims to be vegetarian and vegan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. see this in a very different way. To me, it's a boundary issue. But for the religious clarion, it is a center issue. I see. Yeah. Because you must swap that and not. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, obviously, <laughs> obviously, yeah. That, that that is what we're what we're facing, right? And so, um, wh whether we can construe alternative modes of identity that that do not, where a certain sense of trust and ability for religious faith to carry one through life uh, is maintained, uh, I think that's 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 an important uh, challenge. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I just want to give an opportunity to uh, someone. I mean, there are members of the. I mean, some undergraduates here, young, uh, and uh, raring to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> You're describing me. <laughs> so I would like uh, to give the opportunity to any of them if you want to say something. Uh, give some opinion, anyone? I'm not putting you in a spot, but... <laughs> but I am. <laughs> anyone? Yeah. Darren? Do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for, for naming me. <laughs> but yes, I think um, Prof's question actually really resonated with me, uh, in particular because the local Muslim context, I mean, I'm a Muslim, by the way, so the, the local Muslim context is such that this uh, concept, I guess, of the core and the periphery, um, it makes a little bit less sense to the lay Muslim, I would say, because the, the periphery has uh, solidified so much, I mean, like Prof mentioned, and that, that the whole thing becomes the core. You know, you, you, it becomes difficult for you to uh, imagine any kind of porosity because the core has become all of it, and any deviation, uh, I think even uh, Mirul was mentioning just now, not just here, but in this region we have um, local varieties of Islam that have 232 uh, definitions 
of what it means to be like the core you know, is so largely and widely defined that there is no there is no uh, yeah that's and, very that's very interesting yeah and so you know I just thought that you know this, it's pretty interesting to see because from the Christian perspective that I've been hearing a lot um, you know this makes a lot of sense but from I guess a local Muslim perspective it it seems to be I mean I like the idea of course but the idea of uh, salvation as well, of um, exclusive salvation, of exclusive truth, monopoly over um, who gets, who is on the right track, who is on the right path. Um, I think those are really difficult questions. And unless there's some kind of uh, reimagining of what it means to have monopoly over truth, and if this idea of multiple centers of truth can actually be uh, developed as opposed to only one party having yeah. one monopoly, um, I think that that's a, that's interesting for me. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting because uh, because uh, it's almost like a center spreads out that there is no periphery, right? Uh, or you can say, well, the, the kind of the, and and then then the difference becomes a defining thing. Uh, and, uh, a little bit uh, a funny story is uh, I mentioned it, uh, yesterday is uh, one of the very early critics of Christianity. This is, uh, we're talking third century, early third, third century, um, uh, was Celsus. And he complained that uh, Christians are so bent on being different that if the whole world became Christian, they would be something else. <laughs> Just to be different. <laughs> right? Uh, Oregon, the church father, Oregon, uh, had an answer uh, to it, obviously. But you can see the sensibility that he observed, uh, how difference becomes so fundamental and defining that you're completely invested uh, in this. And that gives you full, uh, your full identity. Um, I'm hoping that there's something in faith that uh, also crosses this uh, idea of certainty in the in the almost like a completely uh, dogmatically defined world, so that uh, the idea of God, uh, the Creator, God who is in many ways beyond uh, reason, that is a foundation of, of, of everything, also crosses that and uh, allows us kind of trust and a certain form of confidence without having full, extensive certainty of what, 180, how many? Yeah, 200. 200, and okay, well. I think we need to rediscover transcendence. That's a different way of, nice way of putting what I'm just saying. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes, uh, quick announcement. Uh, Firstly, uh, we're going to organize a lecture, uh, a seminar actually, uh, between uh, Center for Interview of Understanding and uh, possibly uh, National University of Singapore and also the Biblical Graduate School of Theology. On the 21st of September, Professor Ernest Chu will give uh, a lecture on 200 years of Christian-Muslim relations in Singapore, bicentennial. <laughs> well, basically charting the progress and also uh, what has transpired over the last 200 years in terms of the arrival of Christian missionaries, uh, the colonialism, etc., and independence and where we are today. Uh, and the respondent for that will be Professor Said Farid Alatas. So more details will be out uh, by next week, so uh, you'll be on the mailing list. Uh, last but not least, uh, the center after this is food, uh, <laughs> but there's also boundaries, so there are some vegetarian options. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for coming and hope you continue to support thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you.